And we are now going to our last speaker of the day, who is Professor Jaco Wallinga. He's head of the Department of Modeling of Infectious Diseases at the Dutch National Institute of Public Health, RIVM. And um, in this role, he really has had a front row seat in the scientific modeling of the spread of the COVID-19 uh, 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 in the Netherlands. And furthermore, he's also professor of mathematical modeling of infectious diseases at Leiden University. He's one of the editors of the flagship journal of epidemiologists called Epidemiology. And he has over 100, 150 papers on his name and uh, the prominent role his models played in battling COVID in our country uh, almost made him kind of a celebrity over here. And it's obviously also the reason why we invited him to be here today. Um, also with Jaco, uh, his presentation has been pre-recorded to avoid uh, technical issues. Jaco is also here to answer questions. So uh, welcome Jaco, thanks for uh, being here and uh, sharing your work with us and um, the presentation can start. Thank you for uh, inviting me to present at this annual meeting. Uh, despite this being an online event, it feels a little bit like coming home in a very weird way. Um, as a title for my presentation, I chose Curbing the Spread, Observations, Interventions, Models and Predictions. And in the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to convince you that this was an appropriate title. First, uh, a little bit of background. Um, I work at the Infectious Disease Modeling Unit at the RFM, the National Institute for Public Health in the Netherlands. This is a picture of our team working uh, in 2019. We develop methods to assist in controlling emerging epidemics and outbreaks. And we do a lot of work on costs and effects of infectious disease control, mainly about vaccination programs. Um, I've been very busy writing a handbook of infectious disease analysis that was outdated as soon as it came out because in 2020, COVID came along. So since January of that year, we've we found ourselves basically being in the spotlights. Um, for example, this is an article in Science that appeared about our work, our team. And we've been working since then on uh, topics like statistical learning from all the incoming data on this pandemic. We've been doing scenario analysis, uh, making projections, um, and basically um, most important thing like informing uh, the relevant platforms for decision making for infectious disease control and explaining our work to the media, to the public. And this all in, um, at kind of an unprecedented level of attention and pressure. This article basically concludes that if we are wrong, the hospitals will overflow. So that's the pressure we work in. Our role in the decision process in the Netherlands is sketched here. Basically, uh, there's a lot of data coming into our institute. Like we are working here, the analysis and modeling. Then we advise all the platforms, for example, the outbreak management team in the Netherlands, and that uh, platform advises the government who makes the policy decisions. And of course, we do this in close collaboration with all our partners. A little bit of background on the epidemic in the Netherlands. Um, here you see a picture with time on the horizontal axis from February 2020 onwards. Till the, and um, here you see in gray um, the number of positive cases. You see the red line, the number of hospitalizations with COVID-19. The blue line is the intensive care unit admissions and the yellow line is the number of uh, deaths uh, with a positive test. And basically what we record is the number and timing of all these events, symptom onset, positive testing, hospital admission, intensive care unit admission and death. And our specific job uh, as infectious disease modelers is to model the relation between these events. And the causal relations in an epidemic are basically shaped by the transmission of infection from one person to another. I indicated this in the figure in blue, like this person infects another person who infects two other persons. And this is the time axis. And each infection implies one infector. That's something we use a lot. Um, there's also the time order of uh, events for the same individual. An individual becomes infected, indicated here, has some onset, has a positive test, and may continue to go on to be admitted to the hospital, the intensive care unit, and the person may die. So these are the relations we model. Um, 
The first thing we did uh, last year was look at the timescales of uh, infections of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Like we um, estimated the incubation period, which is the time from infection till symptom onset. That's about five days on average. Um, that's the publication that was done in January, February 2020. We estimated the serial interval. That's the time from symptom onset of an infector to the symptom onset of the infectee. That's about four days on average. And you may already infer that's also the average time of the generation interval, the time from infection of an infector to the infection of an infectee. From this, we can also infer the proportion of pre-symptomatic transmission. Um, that is basically the proportion of individuals where the difference between this serial interval and the incubation period is negative. That's indicated in this graph that comes from this publication. And we find that in more than half of the infections, um, these occur before symptom onset of the infector. That's pretty important information for infectious disease control. This was all at a very early phase. Um, then we focus on the transmissibility of the infections. The key variable here is the re reproduction number, indicated by capital R, the average number of secondary infections per primary infective. Uh, we developed different uh, estimation um, procedures. Basically, the, these estimation procedures take the data as they come in with case identifier, symptom onset date, identifier of the infector. Based on that, we can calculate the serial interval. They use this information to count the average number of times that cases with a symptom onset date on a specific day are listed as an infector, while accounting for all the missing data. And earlier, we developed estimators. This equation is one of them for the reproduction number using the time series of case counts and the distribution of the generation interval. And also we show that when an epidemic grows exponentially in the initial phase, this estimator basically transforms the exponential growth rate in calendar time into a geometric growth rate of, um, in number of uh, generations of infection. And the transformation uses the shape of the generation interval distribution more specifically, it uses the moment generating function of that distribution. You can read all about this in these references. Then, more recently, uh, a new phenomenon occurred. We found several variants of concern. Like, this is the data of spread of these variants of concern in the Netherlands. Um, we measured the proportion of the different variants of the virus, um, specifically the what we call the British variant and the South African variant. And we plotted the proportion in the national sample um, over time by date of sampling. The measurements are indicated by the black dots. And we fit a logistic growth curve, the purple line here. The data is as recent as uh, March 11th here. You can see that the logistic growth curve describes quite nicely how this proportion increases. Basically, the variants take over the epidemic. We use this information to calculate the reproduction number by variant of concern in the Netherlands. So here in this graph, you see the number of um, people who are notified by symptom onset day. The blue color indicates the old variant. The cyan and yellow color indicate the variants. You can see that these variants are taking over and explain why the numbers are increasing. More recently, these numbers can be converted using these estimators to a reproduction number, and the time course of the reproduction number is indicated here. The red line for the British variant, the yellow line for the South African variant, and the blue line for the old variant. And what you can see is that these new variants have always been above one. That means that each infection is replaced in the next generation by more than one other infections. They are basically spreading. Um, why are we so concerned about this epidemic? And of course, that's because of the very high disease burden. We measure disease burden uh, by disability adjust, uh, adjusted life years, DALIs. Um, this graph shows uh, the measurement of disease burden up to December 2020 by age group. So this is number of DALIs by age group. Um, and what you can see here is that the disease burden is very high among the oldest age groups and it declines very sharply uh, by age. Um, 
And we find that despite the very strong uh, control measures in the very first wave of the pandemic, the total disease burden was approximately five times higher than an average influenza season. That's really a lot. Um, well, when you look at this disease burden, you might think, well, perhaps the elderly are, well, uh, have a high risk of infection. We can also look at the cumulative number of infections by age. Um, this figure shows the percentage positive by age group. Um, these estimates are based on a representative sample of the Dutch population. Blood samples are collected and tested for antibodies. And um, this is done in successive rounds. Here we use the latest information um, we had at the time from October last year. And uh, we added the expected number of infections since then. And so this is an estimate for February the 9th. We see that most infections occurred not among the elderly, but among the 20 to 24 years old. They have a very high probability of being infected. Then you might think that's perhaps because these people have a lot of contact in that age group. We also look at the age-specific contacts uh, in the Netherlands. As part of this study that I just mentioned, also a representative sample in the Netherlands is asked for the number of social contacts that's indicated here at different time points. This is a baseline in 2017. This is April 2020, a lockdown, June 2020, September 2020, and February 2021. And this is the um, number of contacts in a household, in the community, and total number of contacts. And what you see in each graph is the age of a, of a participant of the study, from 0 to 80, and the age of the contacts they make, from 0 to 80. And what you see here is a diagonal line showing that most of the contacts, which are green or yellow, are made with people of the same age in your household, or with people who are 30 years younger or 30 years older. So you may recognize that situation. And in the community, most contacts are also made among people of the same age group, primarily among school age children. So that's what we see. We see actually here that the 0 to 15 years old have by far the most contacts. Um, and that implies a much smaller risk of getting infected per contact. And this data is as recent as March the 5th. Um, we use this information about contact patterns to inform transmission models. Uh, the transmission models we use are very standard. It's a so-called compartmental SEIR type ep the epidemic model. Basically, that means that individuals start in a susceptible compartment, then upon uh, infection become exposed, but not infective. Then they are infective, and then they are immune and removed. Um, population is also partitioned into age group. It's an age-specific model. And we choose the time scales in this model uh, such that it matches the observed serial interval. And we calibrate uh, it such that we uh, have the right age-specific probabilities of hospitalization and intensive care unit admission. And um, we estimate the transmissibility parameter of this model uh, between different change points such that the outcome fits the observed number of ICU admissions that we have seen per day. And this is then the outcome of such a model. This is a simulation as of March 5th. You see here time. Um, the black dots indicate the observed number of intensive care units admissions. The line that we fitted with the model is the green line here. And um, the green line represents the fit, the interval, or you may see it, the like green interval around the line reflects the uncertainty in parameter values that we have conditional on this fit to the observed number of intensive care unit admissions. So you see it's pretty broad. And when we make projections into the future, assuming that the contact matrix remains the same, it explodes over time, not surprisingly. We also calculate what would have happened if uh, the control meshes were different, but if the con contact matrix would have been different, that's a red line and a blue line, also with intervals there. So those are the counterfactuals uh, that we uh, model. We also use this model for scenario analysis, like what if the contact metric matrix would change in the future, uh, for example, when we are thinking about taking different measures later on. And so there are like three different things that we do with these models. Um, we make projections into the future, like 
one or two, three weeks ahead, then the uncertainty intervals have exploded. We can calculate what would have happened if we have had done things otherwise, and we explore our possibilities for the future. And um, I think the way in which we can gain confidence in that these simulation results hold some meaning is the kind of logical structure that we account for the right relations, the causal relations between infection events in this model as we observe them. Then, of course, we also evaluate the different vaccination strategies. Uh, what we find is the, when the objective of a vaccination strategy is to minimize the number of infections, uh, then it's best to start with the age group that has the highest hazard rate of infection, and that coincides more or less with the highest incidence infection that's shown in this graph, this age here, number of notifications um, per person here. And basically that means that you have to start with the younger age groups. If the objective is to minimize the number of hospitalizations or deaths, we should start with the age group that has the highest risk of hospitalization or death. That's shown here. You can see then we should start with the highest age groups. Then uh, looking to the future, um, we realize that monitoring the epidemic will become much more difficult as there are now positive tests that you um, can do at home. These don't have to be reported. And also as we vaccinate, the hospital admissions may decline by the oldest age groups. So we kind of lose sight of the epidemic. Uh, one way forward is to use um, uh, self-reporting of COVID specific symptoms. For example, in Infexirada that was set up, here's a plot of the number of um, reports with COVID symptoms in the Infexirada. There are actually many more topics I could talk about, like uh, COVID-19 on the Caribbean islands that we deal with, the impact of large-scale testing, and um, the impact that contact tracing and the app have on uh, the effect of contact tracing. Unfortunately, there's not uh, enough time for all of that. Um, a final point that I would like to address is um, communicating uh, the system dynamics um, that we analyze, the risks and uncertainties in our research. Um, basically, this is um, a question mark to us, like how to do this um, like properly. We have to communicate, to, of course, to the policymakers. We do this through the WHO or through the outbreak management team. And their confidentiality system, uh, statements are very common. We, of course, have to inform the public and uh, obviously, uh, privacy issues around the data um, of testing or privacy issues of the notifications is crucial here. We, communi we communicate to our scientific colleagues uh, through publications that open science is a norm. And in times of crisis, of course, timeliness of um, communication is essential. And um, as you may know, what we do is we provide regular public updates with snapshots of ongoing work um, every week or every two weeks. Basically, this is uncharted territory. Um, we find uh, an almost unrealistic expectation that here we should satisfy the criteria for timeliness, for confidentiality, privacy regulations, and open science all at once. Um, and we should achieve this in just a few hours of analysis, which basically leaves us with a question on how to do this properly. Then. Uh, perhaps uh, the most important slide. Um, this um, work that I've showed is very much a team effort. So I'd like to thank my colleagues in uh, our modeling team at the RFEM and also our colleagues at the broader epidemiology uh, team for COVID-19 and uh, also the colleagues at the Leiden University Medical Center and all the colleagues who tried to reach out to me. So thank you, um, wholehearted thank you to all my colleagues and thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Janne. This was uh, really interesting. Um, I see that already some questions have been asked in the chat and um, I also see that you've been uh, answering one of them. So uh, if someone wants to ask a live question, so to say, rather than via the chat, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Peter, Peter Trapman. Thank you very much uh, for this nice talk, uh, Jaco. 
Um, I was wondering, um, you have those nice, uh, well, I know a bit about the modeling, of course, uh, but uh, you have this nice um, uh, matrices of contact rates for age groups. And well, I suspect that many, uh, well, you hinted at it, that uh, some of those contacts are within households, uh, structures, parents and children, perhaps children and grandchildren, perhaps in schools, uh, people meeting at the uh, meeting people of the same age, uh, which also those households also account for repeated contacts. Do you think that uh, taking household structure or school structure explicitly in the model uh, will change some of your results? and when the, it will change? Thank you. Okay, I'm unmuted now, so I can answer <laughs> you. Um, yeah, uh, so thanks, Peter. Um, I admire the background that you uh, show. Um, yeah. um, the uh, we, we also use different models uh, and one of them is, uh, for example, like household models to see like mm -hmm. how different contact patterns um, can be, of how uh, contact patterns can be modeled in a different way. Uh, and like, I think that's what you suggested, like in a matrix uh, that I show, we, we only structure by age. And uh, basically you can contact someone in your household who can contact someone in a household and at Finitum, it, and we know that most household consists of well fewer than uh, I think on average two uh, two and a half persons. So we can also allow for that. Uh, we use that as well for some questions. But I think this specific structure we use that to model the spread of the uh, infection um, on the national level through the Netherlands, and that goes like surprisingly well. So we see it as a kind of first order approximation of the contact structure that's much more complicated. But this uh, seems to work um, good enough to capture um, yeah, the age-specific spread and to capture uh, the age-specific contributions to spread. And we can pinpoint the age group that is the driver of infection and the other age groups that basically suffer from the infection. Um, and uh, like as soon as we want to ask more um, specific questions, like for example, like what is the risk of um, transmitting from one household to another? Uh, how can we address that? Then we shift to other models. And I, I think that's, um, yeah, there's a limit to where you can, uh, to how you can use these uh, SCR type models with only age structure. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, thank you. Uh, there was a question on the chat from uh, quite a few people, but uh, the one from Art van der Vaart. Can you give an indication of the meaning of the uncertainty margins? sampling error or expert knowledge or Bayesian or backtesting? Yeah, that, that's, that's an, uh, well, of course, an excellent question. Uh, I um, should have explained that in the presentation. Basically, um, what we do mm -hmm. is uh, we have the, um, uh, the model, which is a deterministic model. We fit it to the data that gives us um, uh, some kind of uncertainty of the parameter value for the transmissibility that we estimate. We have for mm -hmm. some other uh, variables, for example, the contact patterns that Peter mentioned. We also have a um, measure the uncertainty in that, and that's what we combine and then we simulate forward and that determines basically the intervals that we show. Um, so uh, I think they come closest to kind of, um, uh, kind of Bayesian um, interval. Um, if we would do it in a, yeah, uh, I think our approach is a bit more likelihood this, if I would say, but, uh, I, think, I think it comes pretty close to Bayesian uh, intervals, but it's really simulation based. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the way to in interpret it. When I show the median, it means that out of the, all the simulations that we did, 50% of the simulation results were above that line. Yeah, so I, I think that's the way to answer that question. So, that yeah, question. okay, uh, thank you. Um, another one with the hand raised is uh, Dong Chuan uh, Chen. So. Hi, Jaco, very nice Hi. to see Good you Good to again. see you. Uh, so uh, my question is for the estimation of R. Uh, so uh, of course uh, you need the, in the generation interval or the serial interval, the parameters to estimate R, but uh, 
as several literatures have already said that the serial interval is changing over time. And even so without the intervention due to the progress of the infection, your susceptible depletion will, will become more and more. So your generation time will naturally become shorter if you look like in a forward looking manner. So how to uh, take that into concern into your estimation of R? Yeah, that's a excellent question. And um, so, so, so I can uh, answer um, part of that. Um, well, uh, at the moment we are kind of investigating these um, aspects in a very much more theoretical paper um, that goes out very soon, I hope. Um, but, but you're right, there's a kind of, um, uh, how, how would you say, a kind of competing risk e event um, process like um, in infection, like somebody is in, uh, can be infected uh, by multiple persons. So if there's a lot of infectors around, you expect that the generation interval will be a bit shorter. Um, because it will be infected by the first one who infects you and not by the last one. Um, so actually, uh, the short answer to your question is we don't take that into account because um, in our simulations, we show that that effect is not really large. Uh, I think uh, depending on what you assume for the contact structure, we can think of situations where it can be um, really large when there's a very, uh, locally a very high density of infectors around few susceptibles. And I think then you really have to take that into account. Um, another way uh, in which we could have taken it into account is in the estimation process of the reproduction number, the way I showed it, it's basically um, a kind of, you can think of it as a likelihood ratio, the likelihood of being infected by um, your infector relative to all the others that were around, but you can also do it based on the hazard rate. And by doing that, you take into account um, the aspect that you uh, mentioned that there can be multiple, um, when there are more infectives around that the generation interval will shorten. So um, yeah, so we haven't taken it to account, uh, but we could, but we don't think it really matters a lot in this situation. Uh, okay, another question is that, uh, you know, there's difference between the WT method and the Cori method. So mm -hmm. uh, what's, what is the method that you are currently using for predicting the, uh, for estimating R in the Netherlands? Yeah, the, the method we use for estimating R is the one that I, um, <laughs> that I showed in the, the slide um, while ago. But basically, that's um, um, yeah, another way of saying that is that what we estimate really is the number of secondary cases that we can attribute, attribute to one infector. So uh, in the case that we would know exactly who infected whom, and if you would count the number of secondary infections, that's the number that we estimate. So that's a very clear interpretation. You can also estimate it in a way that's actually kind of um, relative infection rate. That's what you call the Curie method. And that's basically a kind of step in our way of calculating it. So you can see it in the middle part of the equation. It shows up, it gives almost the same result, but it's shifted slightly by just uh, one or two days. Um, and that's something that we use uh, some, some for some other situations. For example, when we want to do a uh, something like a regression analysis for various factors that might explain the changes in reproduction number, then that will be the, um, the right method to use. And on the slide where I explained the uh, reproduction numbers, there's the, I think the bottom reference is a very nice paper by Katie Kostic uh, that explains exactly the differences between these methods and when to use which flavor. Uh, also yes, there I've, in reality it doesn't matter that much really yeah. yes i've read that paper and there's yeah. another paper right, written by the chris and chris mm -hmm. prague so there's a method that combines the wt method and the Cori method and try to uh combine it so at a certain time it will yeah. be better than both of them have you ah, that's interesting think of that yeah. thank you okay that's okay. the end of my question thank you very yeah. much Thank you. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat. Uh, um, I also have a short question myself. I work with the uh, uh, RIVM uh, Corona Gedrags Unit, so the behavioral unit every now and then. And what we can clearly see from, from their research is that people's adherence to the rules uh, is seems to be going down. Uh, people are kind of fed up with the pandemic and not sticking to the rules anymore. Um, to what extent 
is that something you could link into uh, your models uh, to also take that into account? Um, yeah, that's uh, um, like a good question, also a difficult question, because uh, you're right to, uh, to say like uh, we use various models. And so the question is like, uh, to which mod models um, should we link it? And one way is, I think to link it to our models uh, that we use to estimate the reproduction number. Um, basically, that's just a kind of data analysis part. And I think there we can use it, um, say again, an example of say a regression analysis to find out uh, whether this behavioral is really um, is associated with the transmission that we estimate with the reproduction numbers. That's one way to do it. You can also say that you, uh, another way to use it is that you use it in this kind of prediction models, the, the transmission models that we use. And there we assume that uh, I think the behavior might be constant uh, into the future. And there the, uh, we, we can um, use it to better estimate um, what, um, when we see that the transmissibility is changing over time to what extent it's um, related to different behavior or differences in say the, uh, the viral strain that's circulating most. I think that's what, uh, where we can use it. Um, but I have to say like at, um, currently uh, we estimate the transmissibility at regular time intervals. Whenever the measures change, we also like uh, use that as a change point and we start estimating again. It's very hard to pick up really to what extent the transmissibility is affected by this behavioral change. But I think it's an interesting idea to use that better. Still another question related to that, and that's I think more your field is also that mm -hmm. the questions that are asked are about intended behavior, I think, or to some, some extent it's also um, um, that people report things um, a little bit different from what they do. And um, like we are very interested in finding out data that also informs us about the actual um, actions of people. So that's where we use uh, data on mobility. I haven't talked about that. Like, do people really go um, somewhere and then it's recorded on their uh, mobile phone if they have the right app? And we know that. And that's slightly different from uh, when you ask people, like, yeah. do you really leave your house? There's always a little bit of difference. And I think very often when it comes down to these um, yeah, actions related to how well you protect yourself and your fellow human beings um, from infection, there might be quite a difference between them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, there's indeed quite a big difference between the two of them. Uh, very interesting.